Welcome to another in the series of Open Philosophy videos. In this video we will be discussing the role of mathematics in the laws of nature. As we saw in our review of the history of the idea of natural laws, Renaissance scientists such as Galileo and Kepler had come to the conclusion that mathematical laws caused the order that we observe in the universe. Motivating this was a strong strain of Platonism in Renaissance thought. Plato had taught that the world was made of numbers. Even today, many mathematical physicists, such as Roger Penrose, believe that mathematical ideas have their origin in the Platonic world of ideas. Thus, Platonism continues to be an influence in contemporary science. So, was Plato right? Is the world made of numbers in some way? If not, why do mathematical laws describe the physical world so well? Plato's genius consisted in asking the right questions, but he didn't always give us the right answers. Aristotle was much better at analysis and finding a logical, consistent view of the world. Aristotle pointed out that what exists in the world is not numbers, but the potential to be counted or measured. Consider an object such as a block of wood. Certainly it has extension, it has dimensions, but does it have numbers? If I measure it, I will get a number, but the number I get depends on the fact that I'm measuring it with a ruler marked in inches. If I use a ruler marked in centimeters, I will get a different number. If I use a ruler that is marked in some other units, I will get yet a third number. So the numbers which I get are not a result of the block alone. They don't pre-exist in the block, but they are a combination of the block together with some measuring process. If I were to change the block or the measuring process, the number I get is, would be different. If this seems simple enough, and maybe even simple-minded. We have to remember that some great minds missed this point. Isaac Newton, for example, believed in absolute time and absolute space, whereas Aristotle had defined time as the measure of motion according to before and after. Newton's error became apparent when Einstein developed his theory of relativity. In relativity, we need to consider the measuring process, including the frame of reference that we're using to make the measurement. When we use different measuring processes, we get different numbers. So the answers that we get are relative to our frame of reference and the process we use to make our measurements. This same confusion, thinking that what we measure exists exactly as we measure it before our measurement, is at the basis of many of the confusions in quantum mechanics. Think of a spin zero particle that is decaying into two electrons. In order to conserve angular momentum, the spins of the electrons must be equal and opposite. If we set up both of our detectors in the same way, so as to measure, for example, spin up and spin down, if one measures spin up, the other will measure spin down. The total measured angular momentum is zero, and we're happy because the law of conservation of angular momentum holds. But now suppose that we set one of our detectors, say detector 2, to measure spin right or spin left. Then, by the laws of quantum mechanics, it's going to measure either right or left spin. The problem is that when we add the right or left spin to the spin up or spin down measured at the other detector, there is no way for the sum to be zero. This would violate the law of conservation of angular momentum unless we do something to compensate. What we have to do is take some spin from the detector and say that the total spin before was not just the spin of the particle that we started with, but the spin in the particle that we started with plus the spins in the detectors. This means that when we measure, we are measuring the result of an interaction between the particle that's coming in, say the electron, and the detector. In this measurement, some spin is being borrowed from the detector. If the spin is being borrowed from the detector, it can't all belong to the electron, and so the result that we get is not what the electron had before we did the measurement. As we discussed in the video on optical illusions, what we see is really two things. 
there are two objects, what we think we're looking at, and another object, which in the case of optical illusions I call the subjective object. Here, the two objects are the electron that we think we're looking at, plus the detector. Thus, unlike the platonic view, in which numbers and values exist before we measure them, in reality, the numbers we get are always the result of an interaction between a measuring process and the system that we're observing. We can conclude that the laws of physics, which are mathematical formulations or descriptions of the laws of nature, work because nature is measurable and the relationship between measurements is always a mathematical relationship. If we are trying to move from one set of measurements to a prediction involving a different set of measurements, the only way to do so is mathematically. Next time, we will continue our discussion of the laws of nature by considering their universality and the implications of that universality for topics such as free will. Until then, thank you for your time. Thank you.